Good day, everyone. Richard Copperthwaite for Northwest Access TV. Thanks for joining us. Perhaps you saw our earlier show. Again, another one of, in our series of shows uh, featuring local legislators in these kind of uh, just unprecedented legislative times and other times as well. And very happy to have for the next hour Representatives Sharin Fagard, a Berkshire Democrat. Sharin, nice to see you. And Lisa Hango. A Berkshire Republican. Lisa, nice, uh, nice to meet you and nice to uh, have Thank you on the you. show. And again, we're live. If you're watching us live, at least, uh, we are live. So feel free to even give us a call. We'll take uh, some phone calls. Our number, 528-5315, 528-5315. And we're also uh, streaming live. And Reps uh, Fagard and Hango represent a pretty big district, four towns, a kind of a sprawling district going from Lake Champlain in the west to near Jay Peak in the east, covering Highgate, Franklin, Berkshire, and Richford. And, and I should note, uh, again, the primary coming up in Vermont is August 11th, and one other candidate has filed, that's Daniel Nato, a Highgate Democrat, who has run before for this, uh, in this district. Now, Lisa, just a little background on yourself. I've never interviewed you before. Kind of an interesting way how you managed to get to Montpelier. And it was kind of interesting going back to the last election when I did interview uh, Sharon and other folks running for the office. You, of course, didn't run then. Uh, Joshua Aldrich uh, won an election. He had run for a number of offices and actually won only to uh, resign before things got going. And then the governor, I guess, interviewed candidates. I guess what, the Republican committee, you were one of the names that the Republican committee put out and governor obviously uh, appointed yourself. So so go back, did you, did you think about running for chance last time and you did think about it? Um, actually, I have been asked for a number of election cycles. Okay, and uh, give us, a, a, for that matter, a little background on yourself, too. Well, um, I attended UVM and then left the state to for unemployment, um, subsequently married a Vermonter and started a family, and we came back here to Berkshire to hmm. live on his parents' beef farm, beef cattle farm. Hmm. Um, so that was 30 years ago this month. So um, as I was raising my family, I decided to get involved with issues that were pressing to me. And when I did, um, <laughs> it seems like everything that I, I got involved in was a community service type activity if there was a need, for instance, for a story hour for preschoolers. well we started a story hour at the Berkshire School. Or if there was a need for a um, little program at our church for preschoolers who were having trouble sitting in the pews for the long service, we started a preschool program for the kids. Mm. So that, that was my start in community service. And 10 years ago, I was appointed to the school board, which was then just the Berkshire Elementary School School Board before we merged. Um, so I've been on school board for 10 years. Are you still on the school board? Still on school oh, board, really? yes. It's now a, a consolidated school board, the wow. Northern Mountain Valley Union School Board. Which Boy, they is, gave some long names to these yes, new school boards. Very, huh? and, and we had to use the UUSD at the end, so really? it makes it a very long, to be legal, makes hmm. it a very long name. So that school board is for elementary school only, pre-K through eight, and it's the towns of Berkshire, Bakersfield, Montgomery, and Sheldon now. Mm. Um, mm. So that's been 10 years. And then during that time, sort of maybe about six or eight years ago, I've been asked to run for the seats that were going to be vacated by representatives Pierce and Bayor. Right. And due to family obligations, I really always declined because I knew I wasn't going to be able to give it 100%. Hmm. So then, of course, as you said in the last election, um, four people were running, and Joshua Aldrich was the person who won this seat as a Republican. And uh, I thought everything was good to go. Hmm. And then I opened the St. Albans Messenger one evening. Um, I remember the date, December 18th of 2018, really? and so there even on before, the front, weeks before, he yes, would have, he would right have there on the front video. page was the yeah. article that he had decided not to accept his seat, 
And from there, um, I just couldn't, I, a lot had changed, so I didn't have as many obligations at mm. home. And I just could not pass up this opportunity to continue being a public servant. I felt called to it. I felt compelled to pick up the phone and speak to the county Republican leaders mm. and people who had held the seat previously. So I was told I needed to get support. So I got letters and phone calls of support to the local county mm. delegation. And they held a meeting. They nominated me as one of three people whose names should be submitted to the governor. That process took quite some time. It was right over the holidays. Um, New Year's came and went, and mm -hmm. the process um, took quite a bit of time because it was hard to get everybody down to Montpelier to interview. Mm -hmm. We interviewed first with the governor's <coughs> staff, and um, then I'm sure the governor was busy with the beginning of the session and, and whatnot. Um, so I actually finally got my final interview with the governor remotely because really? I was away on a ski trip when when I interviewed with and him. And when did you? So you were appointed, obviously, and when I, did you actually show I up actually for work? I actually took my seat on um, February 14th, really? Valentine's Day of 2019. Really? Interesting. Boy, I guess, uh, I guess your first session sure seems... Uh, Probably a distant memory, given what you folks have been going through. It seems this like time. it's been very long. Yes. Interesting. Well, you yeah. must be kind of psyched. I picked up paper ballots from the Highgate Town Clerk yesterday, Wendy Duzelon, mm -hmm. who had very good words for you guys. I like Wendy's very good person, and it must be kind of cool to see your name uh, in print or on the ballot this time around. I actually just received an absentee ballot yeah. um, that I requested, and it was really exciting to see my name Interesting. on it. Interesting. Sharon, am I doing better? Am I finally getting uh, your first name? I'm doing a little better. Sorry, Sharon. Perfect. It's been a while. Give us a little background on yourself. I know a very interesting background, as I recall. Oh, um, so I was an Air Force brat. I was born on uh, Howard Air Force Base in the Ancon Canal Zone in Panama. Wow, interesting. And um, we moved around a lot. Uh, my father uh, was a retired fighter pilot. Uh, he flew oh. the F-4 Phantom. Huh. And so uh, when, I, when I hear the F-35s, a part of my... I, they sound a little bit like an F-4 compared to an F-16, and I'm like, oh, yeah. there's a little, uh, but... You probably don't get too concerned about the F-35 issue, or not, uh, or not, um, not the case. You not. know, well, I, I'm glad that, that they're not waking me up if they fly yeah. over my house at night, but, <laughs> um, you know, I grew up on military bases, um, and then my, my dad went to the Air Reserves and the Air National Guard. Uh, my mom passed away when I was very young, so... Huh. Um, my father really had his hands full. I call him on Mother's Day as well as Father's Day, right. you know. Um, hmm. And then I married an active duty uh, military member, and uh, we were in Okinawa when both of our children yeah. were born. He was stationed yeah. over there, and uh, we came back. And uh, Harriers are much louder than F-35s. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've just had a lot of different experiences, been a lot of different places. But when I moved wow. here 21 years ago, it was um, the first place that ever felt like home. Hmm. And I, th I think that it was like coming, rolling back in time to what a lot of kind of rural America was like, where the stronger community um, played played a role and more cohesive and, and people were friendlier and got to know their neighbors. I, I just really fell in love with Vermont. And um, yeah. And here you are. Here I am. First running running for a second term. Yes. Again, I mentioned the other the third candidate who filed Daniel Nato, a Highgate Democrat who's run before. He's your party running as a Democrat. Mm -hmm. I get I get the sense that you fear pretty well with your colleague here who's of a different party. Out of curiosity, will you be supporting Daniel Nato as the other Democrat in the race or um, stay or? I, I will say that I have nothing but respect and appreciation for Lisa Hango, yeah. um, for her intelligence, integrity, and work ethic. Yeah. And um, I think that the many years of experience and um, different functions on the boards of Rise and Notch and everything else that Lisa brings to the table are invaluable. Yeah. And I think that also um, 
that having intelligent people in the minority party um, is a really important balance. Yeah. Um, I do not have a running mate, and I'm not looking for one. What about, um, we, of course, uh, primary August 11th? There's, um, again, it's such a weird, and talk, tell, tell you guys about it, it's such a strange year to be campaigning. But, of course, a Democratic primary for governor. Have you got a choice for governor? Phil Scott seems to get good words, a Republican incumbent for how he's doing. But uh, Rebecca Holcomb, the former education secretary under Phil Scott, um, and David Zuckerman, the lieutenant governor, are you backing any of the Democratic candidates for governor in the primary? Are you staying out of that? or I'm not involved in that. Not involved. Um, my job is to represent the people of my district, and I have a very mixed district. It is not Burlington. Yeah. Um, my, my constituents run the spectrum. Um, it tend to be conservative. Yeah. To be honest with you, if we were in Texas, Phil Scott would be considered a blue dog Democrat. Oh. And yeah. um, I think that the leadership that we have had during this pandemic has been above reproach. And um, I, I don't think we could have asked for better leadership either from the legislature or the governor's office. Yeah. Lisa, Governor, Governor Scott, have you been impressed with how he's dealt with this? I extremely have. difficult ongoing situation I have I um, I very much appreciate his leadership during this time yeah. I appreciate that he's listened to scientific facts and taking guidance from science to determine our course of action I know him as a person I know how terrible he feels about the economic situation I know that it weighs really heavily on him as it does all of us and I I'm, can only imagine how difficult this was for him to make decisions, to close businesses, to not reopen schools, et cetera. Um, and I totally appreciate his leadership during this time. Boy, a big, a big hit to this area is uh, just in the news in the last day or two, although there were rumblings about it for the last month, the USCIS, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, Mm -hmm. Service Center in St. Albans and Essex with 1,700 employees, about 1,100 being furloughed. Yeah. I've talked to one of my good friends who lives in Enosburg who's uh, employed by those folks. You, you, got, you have plenty of constituents who are. Have you already heard from some of them? I, uh, have, not, I have not heard from them. But you certainly have um, a number of constituents yes. who work for those folks. Yes, um, I think um, that this this was in the works, and I read about this a couple weeks ago and have been very concerned. Yeah. Um, we are going to see we're going to see this ripple across the entire nation. I wish there was something we could do at the state level to deal with this, but yeah. um, unfortunately, I'm not surprised that that this has has been determined. Yeah, Lisa, again, just some real bad news locally for Franklin County, obviously. Absolutely. A lot of our constituents are employees of USCIS, and, yeah. um, you know, it's no surprise that they're going to have to furlough employees because many other industries have also had to furlough employees. Yeah. And um, with the borders being closed, there's such a, a less demand for visas and passports. Yeah. With students not being allowed to come in to study, same thing, no student visas. So I really do feel for those people. It's, it's my great hope that the federal government has helped out states mm -hmm. um, to disperse money to other types of businesses, all types of businesses across yeah. all sectors. <clears throat> and I just hope that they take care of their own too, because these are federal employees who um, have worked hard at their at their jobs, and they really deserve to be taken care of. Also, yeah, you touched on again your your district. Of course, four towns, all border towns, mm -hmm. uh, border crossings in each of the towns. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess with the last word, the borders closed to non-essential travel to what July 21st, and sounds like it, that may likely be you know extended even. I mean, that's a, it's got to be a huge, a, a big issue for a number of your constituents. I have spoken, I've spoken to some um, who have immediate family members yeah. in Canada, and they have been unable to see their family members. Yeah. 
I have family members in New York State, and I have chosen not to see them, even though their counties are, are now open to mm -hmm. us without quarantine, but I've made the choice. However, these people who have family in Canada are not able to make that choice on their own. So it's got to be very heart-wrenching for them. And some of them are elderly and not in good health. And those are the people that I really i am concerned about. Um, so far, everybody's been really patient, which has been great. Yeah. But I know as this wears on mm -hmm. and people maybe fall into poorer health or they age, it's going to become more of an immediate need for people to see their family members. So I hope that there can be some kind of exception made for those people who need to go see their elderly mom in Canada. Yeah. And Sharon, just a business. Obviously, there's uh, typically a lot of cross-border traffic. Just the businesses in your four-town district, I mean, just not getting basically any business from folks north of the border. It's got right. a, you right. know, they're in tough enough shape anyway, I would guess. Right. Uh, so obviously agriculture travel, agricultural travel is yeah. happening, but any other business is not really happening. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, and, and of course, you know, we get a lot of Canadian cycling through the area. Right. And, you know, we're not, we're not a giant business center for tourism like Jay Peak is or yeah. the town of Montgomery, but it, it does impact us. Yeah. It definitely impacts us, um, you know. We're and, and that is one reason why the legislature ran and didn't um, didn't go into recess until last Friday because we needed yeah. to to sort out the CARES Act money in order to support those businesses. Right. Again, there and you folks have been. I see your dispatches in the paper pretty frequently. You're certainly putting out a lot of good, useful information. Do you feel like in Derry, I mean, there are a lot of, you know, segments of Vermont businesses getting getting help, what, a, one and a quarter billion dollars coming in from the from the feds. What about Derry? Is Derry getting, it seems like I'm running into a lot of people who feel Derry's not kind of getting their fair right. share of help. And, of course, right. you have one of the, I think, biggest dairy farms right. in Vermont in your district. Yeah. And I'm on the House Ag and Forestry Committee, so okay. um, this is, this is, well, not just my interest, but you know, at this point, my passion. Yeah. Um, we had initially been um, working with the idea of a 50 billion, or I'm sorry, 50 million, <laughs> 50 million dollar uh, package for dairy uh, farmers and processors, and that was downsized um, by about half. And our concern is that there are something like 200 million dollars in unsecured debt that are. Our, our grain companies are holding. So this money wasn't even going to sit in the bank accounts of our dairy farms or our processors for longer than it would take for those checks to clear so they could then pay the debts to their vendors and you know, their, their veterinarians, et cetera. Um, so I am very concerned that the amount of money that passed isn't sufficient to cover um, and I, I know some of that money is being held back in case the, the federal government determines that CARES funding can be used for filling budget holes, mm -hmm. but the budget will be impacted more in the long run if we do not have functional, thriving businesses, and yeah. that includes our dairy farms and our, our dairy processors. Yeah, so again, dairy farms, uh, Lisa, and again, in pretty tough shape anyway. I think the number of dairy farms in the state down to something like 700 or something. I think it's in the 600s now. Maybe in the 600s? Yeah, it's incredible. We, I think we lost another 14 just in the last yeah, couple right. months, last couple weeks in May. But yes, I'm, I'm disappointed about the, the amount of money that dairy got. Um, the governor's proposal was a, about $50 million for dairy, mm -hmm. or for farms in general, agriculture in general. And so all farms, I'm not just going to specifically pinpoint dairy. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I, I don't understand or agree with the decision by House leadership and Senate leadership to have cut that funding down to about $35 million. Yeah some of which is going to forestry and other ag products. So really, dairy is only getting, correct me if I'm wrong, Sharon, 25 million. So um, 
I remain disappointed about that. I don't think it got out fast enough to them, and that's no discredit to Sharon's or the, the Senate's Ag, Ag Committee's work, because I know they worked really hard on this. There were just a number of roadblocks to hold it back, and, um, and the fact that $140 million is being held back for some future revenue hole filling that may or may not happen is discouraging to me too because I feel like it should be going into the pockets of the people who really need it now. And it's not just the farmers, as Sharon said, it's the, it's the vendors. It's the small businesses that exist in Highgate and Franklin and Richford and Berkshire that depend on farm income to keep themselves afloat. Sharon, just the, uh, for the Vermont Department of Labor, just people getting unemployment checks who needed it, who qualified for it, was a big problem. Is, have, have those problems kind of been worked out? I think, I think I was hearing even the governor and some Scott administration people say, hey, call your local legislator if you're not getting anywhere. Can I assume you got some calls from folks Def who were having problems? Definitely. Yeah. Um, so initially there were about two dozen legislators who, who had the bandwidth on top of everything else to, um, to step up and use a dedicated portal to really? file information. And I was um, happy to be one of those legislators. And that is not the case now. There's a direct portal that people can use. Um, we were able to resolve a couple thousand of the PUA cases. We were put specifically on PUA because um, the no. Department of Labor knows the ins and outs of general unemployment insurance, but this was a new program, a new rollout, and yeah. so there were unintended <clears throat> glitches and consequences for trying to match up language. And yeah. uh, so we worked on that, and there, there have been improvements. Most of the people who were on my list to deal, to take care of, were resolved. Um, yeah. But I do know that occasionally, I hear that somebody else is still in limbo, and some of them are terribly desperate at this point. Yeah. yeah. There have been some casualties of businesses. There certainly have here in St. Albans a few businesses. I think were in tough shape before the pandemic and just didn't didn't come back. Have you lost some businesses in your district? Not that um, you have a ton of businesses, but. Have there been some casualties, do you know? You know, if, if there have been casualties, they haven't reached out to me. Yeah. Um, I've been uh, pretty, uh, you know, I'm, I'm accessible through email and phone calls, yeah. um, but nobody has reached out to me specifically about that. Um, yeah. I have heard from, you know, employees who have questions, uh, occasionally employers who have questions. Um, but, you know, some of the news about, like, darn tough laying off employees, it, right. it's, it's, um, it's universal. There are losses, yeah. even with businesses that had a really solid plan. I'm, I'm frankly, really worried about our elder care facilities, our live-in, yeah. you know, elder care that were already strapped in, and then further challenged by some of the legislation that we passed. And of course, the hospital, Northwestern Medical Center, has had some yeah. serious financial issues. Yeah. Interesting. Lisa, what about yourself? You're getting obviously hearing from some of your constituents. Uh, were you able to give some help to some of those folks? Yes. Prior to the legislative portal for PUA, um, we had a, a, a means of helping constituents um, achieve some resolution for their, their UI claims, their unemployment insurance claims. Yeah. So we were very fortunate, I think, in our district that instead of having hundreds of claims that were unresolved, we maybe had dozens mm -hmm. um, yeah. between Sharon and myself. And um, they were resolved fairly, fairly rapidly. There were a few outliers who had really unique situations. Perhaps they were employed part-time somewhere, but they also were self-employed. There were a number of um, cross-references between various statutes that they, they, they really needed resolution by a true expert at the mm -hmm. Department of Labor. Mm -hmm. um, as for businesses, I know there are a couple of our local businesses who have chosen not to open. They're seasonal businesses. They haven't opened. We're hoping maybe they'll open next, next year when things are better. Mm -hmm. um, what about, I'm happening to think, I know some of the uh, Tyler's pretty well, the Tyler place, have mm -hmm. they 
Are they back in business? Are they? Do, um, They're open, but a lot of their, I spoke with Ted Tyler the other day, a lot yeah. of their guests were from out of the country, so yeah, course, that boy. immediately canceled all of those reservations. So, they're very um, sim certainly so they ahead. have a skeleton crew, I believe, and they're yeah. working with what they have in terms of reservations yeah. and, um, and crew to work. Yeah, talk about a great place that's uh, yeah, certainly beautiful. helped put Franklin County on the, on the map. Um, again, you've got a school board, still on a school board. In my earlier show, I interviewed representatives Mike McCarthy, St. Albans City, Casey Two, St. Albans Town. I happened to ask Casey, who's on the House Education Committee, about Vermont State Colleges, and he said he's gotten a lot of calls about that. Um, is that an issue? Are you getting in? Are you getting Absolutely. hearing from? Absolutely. Really? A lot of our constituents either attended one of the Vermont State Colleges or yeah. their children attend or their nieces or nephews. We got lots of emails from former students, um, people who are students now, parents of, of current students wondering what we were going to do to yeah. help save the colleges. Is there hope? I, it sounds like, boy, they were in just a desperate, of course, the former Chancellor Jeff Spaulding even announcing closing three campuses, which certainly got everybody's attention. It sure did. Maybe that was, that was a, good, a good thing. But. It was quite a shock, but um, yeah. it, it's been coming for a number of years. It's been yeah. coming for a long time. I think um, there needs to be a very thoughtful process going forward as to what programs in which locations will best serve the future workforce of Vermont. And the study committees that I've seen that have been set up are looking to those to those very issues mm -hmm. as well as separate study committees that are looking at the finances of the Vermont State Colleges and what's sustainable and what isn't. Is there hope? You know, is there, is there hope for I the think future? there is. I, I yeah. really do. It's got to be reimagined, yeah. but all of education really <laughs> should be reimagined um, in my mind because we, we don't do enough for students to prepare them to be in the workforce without funneling them to a four-year college degree. Yeah. There needs to be more in, more support for tech education. There needs to be more yeah. support for, for counseling and guidance for yeah. career readiness. Yeah. Boy, I know, I know it's done. Just uh, Jeb Spalding, who I've met, and I, I know him a little bit, but I guess I was expecting. I mean, I knew, uh, as everybody was hearing, state colleges were in tough shape. I guess I was expecting to hear either Johnson or Linden might be shut down, but when I heard both were, I was stunned. But are you getting some, are you getting some calls about Vermont um, State Colleges? Initially, when uh, Jeb Spaulding's announcement was made, yeah. quite a number, not so many of late. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, kind of going back to the agriculture, Ballywick, which um, is, is what I pay more attention to because of yeah. my committee work, you know, Vermont Technical College has one of the highest placement ratings. Um, really? And, you know, they're doing it right. They also have something like $78 million in, in deferred um, maintenance costs yeah. on the campus. So we do need to invest wisely. And uh, as Representative Hango said, we need to make sure that what we offer is really serving the best interests of the students that are going through these institutions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's, that's really important. And we have to fund them if we want them to remain. Yeah. And, and, and it's yeah. good, just a lot of hard choices. Well, it sounds like it. I mean, it just sounds like money. I mean, the big complaint for, obviously, Vermont State Colleges is just getting a very low share of state funding. And I'm sure the state's just so awash in money right now. I'm kidding, <laughs> obviously. Boy, talk about a terrible time to mm -hmm. try to get better financial support to Vermont State Colleges. Mm -hmm. On the local front, now, Lisa, what are, again, you're on a school board. Boy, I'm, I'm sure you're getting plenty of uh, questions and concerns about kids going back to school. Mm -hmm. But the plan is for kids to go back to their, their schools. I mean, we're talking next month now. Are you comfortable with that? I mean, are there a lot more details that we things that need to be worked out, or how comfortable are you? And you're on the front lines of this. <laughs> well, the the guidance is evolving daily. Really, mm -hmm. um, the plan is to go back. However, it could be in any way, shape, or form. It could be mm -hmm. all students going back. It could be certain students on certain days going back, certain grades going back, and others 
um, remote. There has to be a plan in place for um, a turnaround if things get worse and the school system needs to work remotely again. So there are really several different plans being developed simultaneously this summer. Um, the hmm. Secretary of Education is um, going to be working with various school districts, all school districts. Secretary to, French? Yeah. To, How do, you, do you think he's doing a, a decent job? Um, I don't have a whole lot of, because I'm not on, on the Education Committee, right. I am on school board, but I don't have a whole lot of um, interaction with his office. Yeah. I see it more from the school board point where we get guidance and then we have to make sure that it happens mm -hmm. and um, in the beginning I think everybody was writing the playbook as as we went along so I have no complaints about maybe the guidance didn't come fast enough well how could it because no one really knew what to mm -hmm. expect I mean I I can remember when we were first sent home um, people thought maybe we're just gonna go home for a week or so and then mm -hmm. go back Never, so, never made it back. Right. Well, Sean, what about, and again, you're, it's pretty rural, doesn't we're, you know, 50,000 in this county, Franklin County, but boy, remote learning, I'm sure, worked just fine for some kids and parents. It sure probably worked not at all for others. And I suspect maybe your district was maybe, you know, was maybe one of the tougher districts where it didn't work so well for a number of kids. Is that your sense, or what's your sense? Um, I've, I've heard some, some parents... Um, share their struggles with it um, yeah. you know educators are trained and yeah. they're trained to do their job <clears throat> um, and they have not just the training but the experience and they're familiar with the subject material and and parents aren't so um, writing the playbook as we go is yeah. is what everybody's been doing whether it's different agencies in our government different branches of government um, business owners employees people trying to teach their kids math that now doesn't make any sense to them because it's done, you get the same answer, right. but you have to go through a completely different process than the one that we learned when yeah. we were growing up. So <clears throat> it's hard and, you know, I, I worry about, you know, if, if we have some kids on some days and not on others, what that does for people's ability to go back to work if they need to work and, yeah. you know, how I think we're still writing the playbook as we go. Yeah. yeah. This, I mean, this, this has got to get nailed down as here on a particular date when people are expecting to know what the guidelines and it's just just still pretty up in the air. I don't for? think so because no. um, what we've seen in other states just with restaurants opening and then all of a sudden restaurants closing yeah. the next day <clears throat> has made me realize that this really is a day-to-day -day thing. Yeah. I'd like to jump in for a minute about the remote learning too yeah. uh, and broadband. Um, another, another huge yeah, issue. We yeah, had, we had a lot of, I had a lot of um, inquiries about that probably because I am on school board and um, even though we have two supervisory unions in our legislative district, we also have schools that are outside of our legislative district that are part of those supervisory unions. So I actually heard from people in quite a number of towns and um, we were able to work with people at the providers, um, for instance, Consolidated Communications. We were able to work with them to get low-income families set up with broadband access. We were able to work with people, families who had mm -hmm. two working parents and students who were taking courses online um, who had very poor internet to get them upgraded. So those, those things I feel were very mm -hmm. successful. There were a few families that we really weren't able to help because they don't have the ca capability, but with the CARES Act money that's been passed in the most recent round of, of legislation, hopefully they'll, they'll get help because there is the possibility that we're going to be learning and working remotely again in the near future. Boy, just there are so many, so many unknowns out there. Yeah. Um, the issue that came up, I think, on social media, I think some legislators are getting beat up for no good reason. I think some people are under the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, that you're getting a pay increase. How can legislators do that? That is not the case. You want to touch on that? It sounds like social media, which I try to avoid. Um, um, this is pretty <laughs> hot, hot with us. Right. So um, the uh, 
what was passed, and, and I didn't vote for it because I felt that it was um, bad optics and this was not the time. There were, there were kind of two pieces to um, what, was, what was in the Pay Act that impact um, legislative pay. One piece, which I fully support, freezes any increase to the salary for a year because typically there's a cost of living allowance increase every year and it may be 1% to 3%. Um, the other constitutional officers, whether it's the governor, the secretary of state, the attorney general, et cetera, receive a cost of living allowance increase as well as a, a step up. like a, And so they, they have typically seen an increase, a percentage increase that's twice, about twice of what legislators have seen. And, um, and the, the House and apparently the Senate voted to, to include this in the Pay Act and pass it. And while in the following, in this year, it would freeze any increase, it would effectively double the increase in future years. So instead of maybe 1.2 percent, maybe it'll be, it, you know, it'll be, it'll probably be more than 3 percent. Um, so, no, they didn't vote themselves a raise for this year. In fact, they voted to have not the typical expected thing that is built in. Um, but there are 180 of us, yeah. and and that's a lot of people to to provide an increase uh, in, in the pay rate in future years. And I, I felt like the discussion needed to be um, had at a different time. We're in a pandemic. Yeah. Lisa, are you getting, getting, running into any people who are getting on your case for getting a, an alleged pay increase? Absolutely. Yeah. I feel like the media did us a really dis, a, a big disservice by announcing legislators vote to give themselves a pay raise. Yeah. That was the worst headline and it was across conservative and liberal oh, press. Really? So I was, yeah. I was compelled to write to a couple of editors and say, hey, look, we did not vote to give ourselves a pay raise. This is what really happened. And pretty much as Representative Fagard just described it. Yeah. Um, yes, I, I voted against it. Um, I do not feel that this is the time when my constituents, even family members, have either lost their jobs, been furloughed, or taken pay cuts. Um, mm. So I certainly don't feel that this is the time to pat myself on the back and, and get a raise. And having having been in public service for 30 years i realized that it's it's not a place to make money and it's it's for the it's really for the good of the people that we're serving and um i just i can't say enough that i'm not really sure how the press got that headline out of what we passed. It was a very unusual way of passing the Pay Act. Normally it's a piece of legislation of its own, but it was tacked on to the budget that we were passing, which was only a three-month bu three budget. So I think it got very confusing when we passed the budget and pieces of the Pay Act were in that. Yeah. But there were opportunities to vote no, and people can, constituents can look up the voting records of their representatives and find out who voted no and who voted yes for those pieces. Just want to mention, uh, folks, if you're watching us live, uh, give a call. If you have any questions for two of our local legislators, 528-5315 is our number. Uh, Governor Scott certainly loath to talk about tax increases, talks a lot about affordability. Is a could or does a does a leaner state government? Is that what may come out of this? Uh, what needs to come out of this, uh, Sharon? Any any feel for that? Um, or tax increases? I guess we're talking what a projected three cent education tax uh, increase, which looked like it could have been up closer to what twenty five cent or so. But are higher taxes inevitable, or is nothing nailed down? Kind of. Um, we need to see what comes out of the federal government again. There may, yeah. may very well be more federal funding, but the next piece of the budget is going to be terrible to pass. It is going to hurt. Um, in in this is my my guess. It, it's. Uh, 
Well, it must be overwhelming. These numbers must be overwhelming to you folks, I would think. When, when I was first elected and uh, we were getting the numbers in uh, the training that, that Representative Hango missed out on because she was appointed, I remember when I learned that our state budget was about half of what Jeff Bezos' salary is yeah. and that a third of that is federal funding. Yeah. I just remember feeling just the tension of yeah. thinking, oh no, here we are, a poor rural state one third of our funding is federal dollars, mm. and you know Medicaid reimbursements and transportation dollars. So, you know we've we've have more in common with some rural states in the South than we do with some of our neighbors, mm. and, and as far as budgets um, are concerned. So, it, it's going to be hard. You know, it, not just in Vermont, not just in the United States, but worldwide. We're, we're going to have to find a way forward. And, um, you know, when, when I have looked at some of these increases in the costs, whether it's to um, the education of our children or elsewhere, a lot of it has to do with skyrocketing health care costs and health insurance costs. And that seems to be one of the drivers. And, and at some point, we're really going to have to address that. Yeah. Governor, I mean, often says, hey, don't just talk to me about revenue. Talk about making some program cuts, maybe making government. Can you picture Vermont state government getting leaner? Does it maybe have to get leaner somehow in the future? Lisa? I don't know the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I've thought about that um, a little bit. Um, what I do know is that all programs, all line items on the budget are going to have to be scrutinized. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, going forward, we're going to have to decide what is really important to Vermonters and what can wait or what can get cut. Um, I really, I have no information about any cuts to programs, specific programs at all. Um, you mentioned tax increases. Yeah. I know that the governor's mm -hmm. line has always been that he does not support any tax increases. Yeah. I certainly don't support any tax increases either. <laughs> I would rather see if there's another way that we can work the budget without raising people's taxes. And I did want to touch on the education tax rate going up the, the three cents. Yeah. That's what your voters, our voters voted on in March at town meeting day. Yeah. And so that was actually, um, the legislature could have raised those taxes in the yield bill, but the legislature wisely chose to keep the rate at what people voted on town meeting day mm -hmm. because that was the will of the people. Mm -hmm. And I do give the people um, who are on those money committees, the, the representatives on those money committees, a lot of credit for keeping the tax rate at what it should be based on what the voters wanted. Yeah. Sounds like uh, some, some people, at least a while back, seem to have some hopes that regulating marijuana, that the state could maybe make some money from, I see your, your, your head motion there, make some money. I uh, interviewed Senators Parent and Brock a couple weeks ago, and Senator Brock had then called regulating marijuana not only a, not a money maker, but a money loser. But and it just seems like some initial hopes that that could really generate some more money for the state. I sure don't hear that much. Uh, is that an issue that will that get any attention from you folks uh, when you go back in August, or is that kind of lost in the shuffle for now, um, or maybe forever? What do I know? So one of the the interesting things about not being in leadership is that oftentimes you don't know what is going to come yeah. until couple days before it shows up. So I, I can't answer the question about whether or not tax and regulate will show up. Yeah. Um, I do know that last evening I was on a Zoom call with somebody who works in the Attorneys Guild in California who described um, the, the tax and regulate as in, in California as despite their best efforts to make it something that served small business interests, et cetera, et cetera, it's just become another gigantic corporate uh, money machine um, and you know I think pinning hopes on uh, pinning hopes on a marijuana market 
is really complicated, especially within 100 miles of the border where federal law is, um, you know, comes into play. And it's a very complicated issue. I took a poll of my constituents, <coughs> reached out multiple times, and kept a tally of what my constituents wanted. And, uh, you know, the, the, the larger number of people said, no, thank you. Yeah. So I'm doing direct representation on that one. Yeah. Lisa, not a, is that an issue that's kind of just kind of no, no, nowhere at this point? or At this point, yes, but it was a hot-button issue. We yeah. heard from constituents about it. Um, Sharon shared her results of the poll with me. Hmm. I am very much against tax and regulate. It came through my committee very briefly last year, 2019. And your, sorry, your committee my is? My committee is the House General. It's General Housing and Military Affairs. Okay. And we also deal with alcohol, tobacco, laws, um, just about anything that doesn't have a committee of jurisdiction huh. with you its name in it, like agriculture or forestry or education. Yeah. Um, so I am not in favor. The, the reports I've heard from states who thought it was going to be a big money maker and they were going to be able to use this money to fund their college programs or whatever they were going to use to fund yeah. it with, it, they have not been successful. And I'm much more concerned um, about the public safety aspect mm -hmm. if we do allow this to become a big business and particularly because it is a it is illegal under federal law hmm. um, what happens if we are near a border and in Vermont we're pretty much everybody is near a border of another state or the border of Canada yeah. uh, like we talked we touched on the Tyler place a beautiful Tyler place on Missisquoi Bay Lake Champlain water quality issues is that kind of another big issue comes up every year, how to, how to fund it. And, and I guess that's been nailed down some, but is that kind of another issue that is lost at least for the moment in the shuffle of the pandemic or? I, I so? expect, um, you know, one of the things that we were really looking at in the House Agriculture and Forestry uh, Committee was um, the idea of, um, and I'm having a brain glitch, of course, because I'm on TV, <laughs> um, uh, but where agricultural practices that um, benefit our environment are worth something. And when farmers do the right thing to restorative, regenerative agriculture, thank you. you know, we were looking at how do you put a value on that and, and how do you reward that? You know, farmers in Switzerland drive BMWs dairy farmers because the Swiss understand that if you want the Alps to be the kind of place that people want to come and go on hikes in the summer and go skiing in the winter, cows are a great, great way to manage the land. Um, so they are paid, it's just a very different model. Um, and, and so we were trying to find ways to um, not only encourage best practices, of course under dairy there's the RAPs, but, um, but also to, to provide some kind of financial reward because there there really isn't farmers are not farmers are not doing it for the money they're they're doing it for the love they're doing it because they've got you know they, it's in their bones hmm. um, but the the two are married you know the water quality and how we treat our agricultural sector are, are very much married we we have to take care of both yeah Lisa Lake course Lake Carmi I've been around for quite a while when St. Albans Bay used to be kind of the poster child for Vermont's water quality problems. And I think Missisquoi Bay mm -hmm. kind of grabbed the spotlight, so to speak. And then in the last couple of years, I think Lake Carmi may have. I know the aeration system, does, uh, what are you hearing from water quality wise Lake Carmi this summer? Any reports? Good news. Yeah. Um, we just got issued a report oh, a couple of days ago that said that water quality is around 40% better than it was a oh. year ago. So that's really good news. Oh. I think the aeration system, given a number of years to work, will, will really help Lake Carmi. Mm -hmm. There are also some culvert projects that are happening right now um, that we're really happy that they're able to go ahead with um, to improve any runoff that's going into the lake from from the the town roads that are around. Hmm. 
Um, I think we did a good job with the 2000, I shouldn't say we, because I wasn't part of the legislature, but the 2015 Clean Water Act, I think that we're on a good path. Everyone realizes that water quality is important, and when we don't have good water quality, it affects everything. It affects tourism, it affects people's homes, their camps, their their leisure lives yeah. um, so this is this is Vermont's economy and we need to keep our waterways clean mm -hmm. right. the coronavirus of course uh, I mean a huge a huge issue mm -hmm. and the the racial unrest issue kind of a mm -hmm. companion or another very big issue not so much as that as a black lives matter racial unrest is that touched on in your legislative district at all I wouldn't think too much but uh, has that come up to some extent um, I have not heard directly from constituents that yeah. are impacted by that. We have yeah. a pretty monochromatic um, yeah. district. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I do know, so I, I'm on the restorative justice panel, and I, I do know that, you know, one of my clients had a, had video of a, a friend of theirs being uh, roughed up, and they had charges. Um, yeah. for saying stop you're hurting him and uh, were basically trumped up charges and and it was all on video and and the judge didn't want to see it mm. but restorative justice wanted to see it mm. you know and and so there there are issues um, but it hasn't really been a, a focus point a focal point yeah. Lisa Anna, are you getting does that come up at all with your constituents or not in, not with my constituents but of no. course statewide it is it is sure. a really hot button issue and the you issue know, of de defunding police of course in Burlington that's been a, a huge issue in recent weeks of course and St. Albans has had certainly an issue in St. Albans too I'm I'm a bit sorry to see that because I think there could be other ways to keep funding but to have different educational programs, use that funding for different educational programs for police officers. I really don't believe in defunding police. Yeah. I don't think it's a good practice to be going forward with. Um, and, and I will say something about the Black Lives Matter. Um, I recently have been in discussions with people who, who say, don't all lives matter? And all lives really do matter. Yeah. Um, I, I really feel that I've never particularly been someone who will say anything against one particular group of persons. And this is, it's really kind of shaking me to the core that we have this much violence and it's all based on angry, people who are angry about certain issues. Yeah. And I really wish with, that we could work together more. I heard a great quote by Dr. Martin Luther King's niece recently, just in the last day or two. And it was so much that every ethnic group, every group of people has something that hasn't been right in their lives. And if we could just work together to help all people then we wouldn't have these big divisions. And she even said, my uncle would not have wanted all this violence, all of these statues mm. being pulled down, all of these um, national parks being desecrated. And, and it really hit me, it really hit me hard. Yeah. Of course, in your district, no municipal police departments, Franklin County Sheriff's mm -hmm. Department and Vermont State Police mm -hmm. kind of in charge of the four towns uh, and I guess that's uh, there's some folks who would like to well, again there may be uh, we talked about cuts possible cuts in Vermont State Police statewide what do you what do you think about it? I think well I think the St. Albans barracks I don't think they've been fully staffed at the St. Albans barracks for years I don't think so I remember learning about a program where they have crisis intervention uh, expert yeah. travel with um, the Vermont State Police um, Part-time, which it needs to be full-time, I could see allocating some of the funding to deal with crises that don't need armed officers to be in the forefront. Um, so 
while I don't think we should just cut funding to police and leave these gaping holes, I think that even, even some police officers, including um, former Burlington Police Chief Brenda Del Pozo has said that, you know, there are some jobs that over time we have put under the umbrella of police departments that they are not the best equipped to handle. You know, there are certainly a lot of situations, none of which I want to see from, you know, any perspective that police have to respond to on a daily basis, and that is what they're well equipped to handle. And thank goodness there are people who are willing to step up and take that job because it's pretty much thankless. Mm -hmm. But there are also some pieces about, um, you know, where people have mental health challenges or, or other kinds of crises that a partnership between police and another organization could probably be more effective in handling those situations. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I kind of think of just my own thought on police. I think of teachers. I was a peer educator for a few years at the St. Albans Town School, and it, I think I had a pretty good opinion of teachers in the first place. That enhanced that a lot, but it just seems like police in some cases are being asked to maybe do a lot more than they should be asked to do. Teachers kind of strike me the same way, mm -hmm. playing parents and stuff. But in terms of state police, mm -hmm. statewide, Lisa, you don't, you don't, you're not thinking this is a bloated budget they have or anything. I mean, you'd be concerned about making cuts. And like I said, I don't think they're close mm -hmm. to fully staffed as it is. That's correct. And I do, I do agree with um, Representative Fagard. I think I remember where we heard about the mental health counselors partnering with the police. I think it was at the Franklin Grand Isle um, Community Partnership meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, it, uh, they work, the police, I think it was St. Albans Police Department, was working very closely and probably still is with NCSS. And um, they would dispatch a mental health counselor with a police officer, and the mental health counselor would be the, the frontline person. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that with all of our police. <coughs> if if that if we were to use the funding for anything other than law enforcement, that would be a great place to bring in more help, more backup for our police. Because oftentimes it isn't a law enforcement problem. It really is a mental health issue. Yeah. Sharon, running for a second term, I, I got to think this election is looking a whole lot different than your successful first election so again forget i mean door-to-door -door campaign and just not not have how are you how are you going about campaigning well i i haven't really and i, I it's was a little little early again the primary is august 11th you have no right. primary opposition um right but you know i i um you can tell a lot about a person by meeting them face to face you can tell a lot about a person by how by shaking their hand and, and that's been removed, and, and that's, that's hard. But um, I'm not, I, I haven't really started actively campaigning. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm still, I'm still trying to take care of other things that I had on the back burner because yeah. the legislative session went long. You've been real, and, real busy until Right, very and, and I'm still like trying to make sure that I'm absorbing information about what passed because you know, the bills that passed were not the same bills that they were a week before. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I still kind of have my legislative hat on. I haven't so much put my campaign hat on yet. Yeah. yeah. It's the same, same for yourself or? Well, since I've never campaigned for anything. Of course, this will be your first, your first campaign. Um, it's all new and different, and it, it's, it's what it is for me. So um, I'm not campaigning right now. I'm choosing not to campaign during the state of emergency. No. I'm answering letters, writing letters. Um, answering emails, I use a website. I'm not a social media presence, so for me, if this campaign does become a social media campaign, it'll, it will be a little different. I'll be at a disadvantage, but that's okay because I feel like I have enough of a relationship with people in my four towns that I'll be able to overcome not being 24-7 on Facebook. Mm. Um, it's just not my thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as for what Representative Fagard just said about the legislative session going so long and just ending and ending so differently than where we thought it would end, yes, we really need to take some time to digest what 
what we actually passed, what it means for our constituents, mm -hmm. and where we can go from here. So I think we're, we're in a good spot that our constituents know how to reach us. Yep. And when they do, we're pretty prompt about replying to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think that um, minus the going door to door and meeting people in person, I really hope that they just reach out to us by email or by phone to talk about the issues. Very good. On that note, we got to call it a day. Thanks very much to Republican Rep. Lisa Hango from Berkshire, Democratic Rep. Sharon Fagard of Berkshire.